So thank you so much for attending our Faraday show this year. Uh, I'm Dave Maiulo. I'm the one who designs, constructs, puts on all these demonstrations to basically show us the world of physics, all right? Make physics real to all of us. And you actually already know a lot of physics. We're going to go over those things as we go through the demonstrations. But you're going to see a lot of fun and exciting things. Some things are going to be kind of loud. Don't worry. We may actually warn you, but we may not. We'll see about that, OK? Now, before I get started with the show, and Mark's going to do a first, a few, first a couple demonstrations, first we want to say hi to all these wonderful young people you just interfaced with out with all those demonstrations. Wasn't that a lot of fun? Yeah, come on in, group. Come on in. Come on in. These are my students. It's people like this who give me hope for the future. I know things can seem kind of dire at times and everything else. Lots of bad news all the time. They're trying to scare us all the time. But working with these beautiful young people gives me hope for the future. And I hope after you spent some time with them out in that room and learned a little bit of science and had a little bit of fun, you feel the same way, all right? So a big round of applause again for those students, right? Now get on out of here. Go ahead. Now, as I said, I'm Dave Mayulo. I basically do all this equipment. But what we have here, we have that special guest star, Mark Paul, yeah, right. one of our professors. And Mark, I'll start our show. Thank you, Mark. Usually they have me come on when they know that they need somebody expendable. <laughs> We've got 40 professors. We've only got one day. That's true. Uh, OK, so at any rate, uh, the first thing is, of course, I would like to thank you all for coming. It's a real privilege to share our joy of physics. And I have to thank Dave for helping into me into my dotage to be able to <laughs> continue doing this. Uh, and the next thing is that we're going to demonstrate principles of physics, but we hope to have a little fun along the way. And I'll step in whenever it gets chancy on being dangerous. And uh, we found that the students that tend to enjoy the demonstrations if they embarrass the professor, uh, humiliate the professor is even better, endanger the professor is better, <laughs> and hospitalize the professor is a, is a jackpot. Uh, there won't be any of that. But we're going to do it like the demonstrations in a physics course, and we're going to start off with Newton's laws of motion. And the first of Newton's laws of motion are objects at rest tend to stay at rest. Objects in motion tend to stay in motion. Objects at rest are like, as my wife points out to me, me on the couch. Uh, so here I have some objects that are at rest. And if I pull the tablecloth fast enough, I should be able to have them stay at rest because of their inertia. And I won't even have to buy a new pair of glasses. <laughs> Next Thanksgiving, you can, of course, try that at home, right? <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> OK, so the next one is objects in motion tend to stay in motion unless acted upon by out some outside force. And I guess we can use this part yeah. over here. And you can turn it on. Oh, OK. You notice they pushed it. You have to keep pushing it to keep it moving. And that was a problem for Aristotle. He thought that that was a natural state of motion for an object to be at rest, which is a, I would agree with entirely, uh, <laughs> not as a physicist. Uh, but here, if I put it at a constant speed, oh, yes, OK, OK, thank you. Dave's the professional here. You see, it keeps going at a constant speed until interrupted by either Dave or I. OK, so that's objects in motion tend to stay in motion. And the next, well, I actually, yeah, OK, all right. I got to position them. Yeah, yeah. Actually, we could close, we can close the, uh, yeah, we're fine. That's good. That's, keep that one open. Okay, next one is Newton's famous law of F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. Or really, if you put a constant force on something, how fast it changes to a high speed depends on how much it weighs or what its mass is. So here's a very low mass object, and I hit it, and it goes flying off into the crowd, hopefully not. And here is a slightly larger mass object. I hit it with the same force, and it just goes a little way. And finally, now here I have a piece of lead, and it has so much mass 
I can practically be out all day and it doesn't move much. I can even put my hand under it and the inertia will mean I can beat on it and it doesn't hurt at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay. Oh, oh my. Uh, oh well, so much. These are yeah. Well, these are mag formers. Magnet tiles are slightly different. Uh, I won't do a whole lot on this. Uh, Aristotle was the one that thought objects tended to stay at rest. Right. His teacher Plato also determined the five regular solids. My icosahedron got crushed. And my dodecahedron here, I'd like to show this because these are nice ways for kid to, kids to find out about magnetism and solid geometry. So you can build a dodecahedron very easily and very quickly. And now the other thing that's very important, these are buzz magnets. And so if you throw them up in the air, they buzz. <laughs> the main thing the main thing about these is that they show you action at a distance. Okay? Uh, this is the magnetism was known before Newton, the existence of it with lodestone, and it influenced him into helping to figure out that gravity was act action at a distance also. So that's also very important. Come on in guys, just have them file up and get their seats. Okay, so what are you, oh, you're going to do that one now, okay? Yes, I am. Okay. Hey, one of the second law of motion was what? Force is equal to mass times acceleration. Oh my goodness, a physics equation. It's got to be real scary, right? No. It's exactly modeling exactly what we see in our universe. That's what those physics equations really do. They just model what physics is all about. So I got this object right here. What is it? That's a bowling ball. Are bowling balls big and massive? Yeah, they are. We know these bowling balls are nice and heavy, right? You hear it hit that table, you know there's a lot of mass there. What's that bowling ball attached to? Is it a big heavy rope? There are two things. No, nah, that's just a light here. little string. Yeah, that and if one, there's anything you get out of our show at all, second. it's that human beings really are scientists all the time. We really first. are. We do experiments in our head all the time. We're always uh, looking at things and saying, well, that's yeah, how that must yeah. work. So as scientists, can you tell me, that's can okay. I pick up that heavy bowling ball with that light little string? Do you hear different answers? <laughs> yeah, and that's what scientists do all the time, too. They're always fighting about things, but what do they do to find out what's really going to happen? What do they got to do? Do the experiment. That's how we really okay. learn in life, right? Remember that through your lives. Do the experiment, you're going to learn. So if I move slowly, I can move that bowling ball right off the surface of that table, just like that. Now, am I moving the bowling ball fast? No, it's just kind of hanging out there, right? And please don't take your phones out now, but after the show you go, hey Siri, what's a jerk? Really? <laughs> really? Because a jerk is actually a physics term. It really is. It means a change in acceleration. And if I'm the jerk up here and I pull up like that, we break that string just like that. I just change that acceleration a little bit and it actually breaks the string. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. More acceleration, more force on a string, as you just saw right there, OK? So that's what we have. But we're going to do it in a whole other way. What we're going to do is actually use the atmosphere. And if I was to go up to you and I was to say, how heavy is the air pressing down on your body all the time? You would say, nothing. You would say, you don't know, right? Because we're always in that air pressure. We really don't know how much that force of air is on us all the time. We feel it all the time, but because we're always in it, Unless you're an astronaut or you can climb Everest, you really don't know how much force is on your body. So to show you how much force is on your body from the atmosphere, we're going to take all the air out. No, 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 no. Not from the whole room. <laughs> Just from this long tube right here. I'm going to turn on this pump right here. It's going to pull all the air out of this really long tube. Now, let's explain our experiment. Because of what I have right over here on the one side of this long tube, inside that tube, is a ping pong ball. Ping pong ball is a very light and fluffy piece of plastic, not much mass at all. On the other side of this really long tube, I have three what? Soda cans. Soda cans are made of what? Metal, right? Yeah, they're metal. A lot more mass than this little fluffy piece of plastic. But here's what we're going to do. Now that we've pulled all the air out of this really long tube, 
I'm now going to puncture this long tube on that side right there. Remember Newton's second law. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. The force of the atmosphere will re-enter the tube on this side, accelerates the ping pong ball down the tube. And when it leaves this side of the tube, that ping pong ball will be going 700 miles an hour. Wow. Yeah, that's how much force is on you all the time. But what's right here? Soda cans. What's going to happen to the soda cans? I say we do the experiment and find out, right? Now, two things about this. One, I dare anybody to see the ping pong ball move through the tube. It happens so fast, it's really hard to see. Two, this is an extremely loud noise. So if you're scared of loud noise, especially you here in front, cover your ears, all right? Three, two, one. Let's see the results of our experiment. Remember, that was just pushed by what? Air, the same pressure that's on you all the time. Here is soda can number one. Punctured completely through by a ping pong ball. And this, hey, these Sprite cans are really tough, so it never actually made it through there. But do you think we're playing ping pong anytime soon? <laughs> no, there you go. There's a souvenir right there. <laughs> now, thank you. Now, there's a third law of motion. There's a third law of motion. It tells me that every action okay, has an equal it. and opposite reaction. That's the rule. That's the law. And we kind of know this, right? So if I take my two hands together and I apply a lot of force in both ways, you can see I'm pressing really hard, but there's actually no motion there, right? Nothing was moving. And here we have this very pretty red cart. And here's what I can do to the red cart. I can push on the surface of the red cart really hard. But it just pushes equally back on me, holding me up. Again, a lot of force down and a lot of force up, but there's no motion there. But this law and rule for every action, an equal and opposite reaction, does give us motion. What's that? A balloon, right. What is it now? A bigger balloon. A balloon filled with air. And we just showed you how massive air is, right? So we got all that mass in there. What happens when I let the balloon go? The balloon goes one way. What does the air do? It goes the other way, which is why you get motion with this rule in this law. Three, two, one, and off it goes. But that's not so impressive. Let's try the exact same experiment with this. What's this? A fire extinguisher filled with lots of force, a whole lot of CO2 under very, very, very high pressure. I'm going to take all the force of this fire extinguisher. I'm going to hit that sail right there with all that force. Now, as scientists, I want you to tell me, what direction will this part then go in? I see hands going everywhere. <laughs> Look, there's no grading here today. It's not even pass fail, all right? You can say anything you want, no one's going to judge you. So let's do a physics survey. Who says I go that way? Good. Who says I go that way? Awesome, all right. Who says I go this way? <laughs> Thanks a lot. Who thinks I'm headed this way? <laughs> Don't you raise your hands. Come on now. Hey, two things about this one. This is an extremely, extremely loud noise, especially you here in front. Please cover your ears with your fingers. And it's just like a grenade. Yeah. You, actually you can also the go up there. Let's see the direction I go, go in, all right? There. There's seats up there. Three, two, one. Which way did I go? Okay. Nowhere. The only thing that happens is your butt gets really cold. That's yeah. it. <laughs> Goes right down your pants. Now why? You saw and heard how much force was against the sail, but there was no motion. Well, you don't push on yourself and go into motion, right? That's not how this law and rule works. In fact, you're on a skateboard. Anybody here ride a skateboard? You push on the ground, right? Push on someone standing next to you. You don't push on yourself. Hey, do rockets have sails? No rockets don't have sails, so what do you do to this rocket cart to really make it a rocket car? Take the sail off. And this is why we have Mark. Because <laughs> Mark is now going to sit on this rocket cart. I'm taking the sail off, and I'm going to stand right behind him like this. What direction is Mark now going to go in? It's, yeah, he's going to go way right that way. And he's wearing his helmet because we never know when he's going to crash. But 
Let me ask you this. Do I have to be behind him with this sail for him to go forward? No. no. There's nobody in outer space standing behind rockets. That's a really lousy job to have. <laughs> it was a job they gave me right here, all right? Let's see some rocket motion in action. Three, two, one. Actually, we believe in safety here. This is my old college football helmet. You notice it's cracked. That's why we let me keep it. Actually, my old college football team is playing today in the uh, Final Four of the Division uh, cha Div NCAA Championships, uh, the quarterfinals. Now, just this is the Did way I used to do this particular demonstration. Sure Go ahead. <laughs> Takes me a while to work my courage up. <laughs> Actually, in the middle of that demo, it, switch to the other one. In the middle of that demo, here is another one. Uh, if you see, I don't hold it, so I shoot it between my legs. This happens. The first time I ever did this demo, I had a little bitty fire extinguisher and an old pair of racing skates, and I was on a rug floor in a building next door, and nothing happened. And I got so angry, I came back the next time with one of these 50-pound fire extinguishers. I went out and bought a new pair of <laughs> racing skates. And then, as physicists like to plot things, common sense versus time. <laughs> Usually, it keeps going pretty well up. But mine turned over and went to dead zero because I didn't like the rug floor, so I got up onto a table about that height. <laughs> And I discovered if I didn't hold it very carefully like I did, it sends me into rotation and translation blowing off the table. There's still people who can't believe I made it through that one. But I learned a lot of physics in midair. I remembered it all of a sudden. This is dumb. Okay, that was all linear motion. Now rotational motion, things that go around in a circle. And uh, I like this particular way of starting it off because a string is really nice because I can't make something move like this, not like this, or like this, or like this. The only thing I can do is pull on the string towards my hand. And so if I swing it around like this, uh, it's always being pulled towards the center. And then if I swing it around like this, it's always being pulled towards the center. And so the force is towards the center. If I let go of it, it will go in a straight line because there'll be no unbalanced forces on it. Watch out downfield over there. I'm not very good at this. Okay. Oh. Now. Here's Newton's second law again, all right? Well, I'm going to fill this wine glass with that champagne. Oh no. Oh, yes, yeah. oh no is right. Oh, You're in the front row. <laughs> a very, very flat tray. I'm going to put that wine glass in the center okay. of the flat tray. It'll and be then right. I'm going to give it to Mark. <laughs> and here's the deal. If he can do the same thing with that flat tray he just did with that pumpkin, he gets to drink that champagne. In the old days, when I used to do the fire extinguisher between my legs, I really needed a drink about now. Okay, let's see. Can you, can you stay here. There's only one problem. I don't know how to stop. Whoa! Yeah! <laughs> I forgot, what's this for? <laughs> Intercepted. This could be an illustration of uh, circular motion. 
and pinning things in. That's why people, when they play lacrosse, cradle it very hard. They're pinning it in so when people hit them, uh, they, they, it doesn't get knocked out. But what I'm using this for now is to illustrate uh, the following. If I was to take this and I was to throw it at the audience, really hard, of course I'd be in for a suit because of fa <laughs> something moving with lots of what we say energy of motion can convert into energy of broken noses and things like that. <laughs> and destruction. Uh, on the other hand, there's not that, so it's energy of motion. There's another type of energy and that is this guy can be converted from energy of position potential energy into energy of motion by just turning it over and it hits this floor with a certain speed. So up here it has energy of position, down there it has energy of motion. They're just changing places. Okay? If I hold it even higher, it has more potential energy and if I drop it out of there, it hits the floor with a higher speed. So more potential energy has gone into energy of motion. Want to show them a pendulum? Uh, yeah, I can show them a pendulum, but let's call up the pendulum in the spring now. Uh, here is a pendulum, and it is sort of like dropping something, but it always travels on a circle. So I displace it over here, and it swings down, and it comes back. All energy of motion at the bottom, all energy of position at the top. But the students usually don't like that because I wasn't in danger. <laughs> So, uh, do we need to put up the screen That's for this? That's what I'm doing. Yeah. Is that the way the letter goes? I think it goes like nope, this. Nope. Turn it the other way. Yeah. <clears throat> there we go. So this is sort of putting your money where your mouth is, or your mouth where your money is? I don't know. Here we have a heavy steel ball, a wrecking ball, and it's got a lot of energy of position up here. And if I let go of it and it hits that brick down there that goes into energy of motion first, and then energy of destruction. So now I take the place of the cinder block. That's what the students like. Okay, so I start off with it at my nose here. And I let go of it. And of course it will convert to energy of motion, then turn around and come back. But when it gets back up here, it should stop before it crushes my nose because you can't end up with more energy than you started. So let's hope I don't move forward. I don't think, did I move forward? A little bit. Ah, oh, I think I'm fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My students are always rooting for the wrecking ball. It's demoralizing. <laughs> okay, so where are we up to? Okay, now there, oh, let's go back to the, the, uh, the, the video screen with the display of the simulations. Stay there. Stay there. Uh, the simulations yeah. of the uh, two. Stay now, Stay here. Don't move. there's a couple ways you can transfer energy of motion and energy of position back and forth. Ah, uh, there's my laser. And we need to bring the screen down. Here's the pendulum. Actually, these are fun things for a laser. If you buy lasers, be very careful with them, though, about how, what power they are, and don't believe the power that they say they are. You don't, you never let a, you treat a laser like a gun, you never let it cross anybody's eyes. Uh, here is a pendulum converting potential energy to kinetic energy, potential energy, and here's a shorter pendulum converting potential kinetic, potential kinetic, potential, it does it much more quickly. So the there's a characteristic time in the conversion process between the two. As a matter of fact, you can use a, a there's a pendulum clock that you can adjust so it can keep track of time for you. All right, so that was one. And now here's our, here are two springs, and you can see a very light mass on a spring vibrates quickly, 
and a heavy mass attached to a spring vibrates slowly, so the conversion between the two types of energies has a characteristic time scale that depends on the particular system. Here's a real is this okay to do now? Absolutely. Here's a, here's a real spring in a weight. This has potential energy when you stretch it, and if you do exercises, you can pinch your chest hairs off. Uh, but if I start it like this, and I give it a kick of any sort, it converts Whoa. energy, <laughs> potential energy and kinetic energy. We'll sign them up. <laughs> uh, potential energy and kinetic energy back and forth on a regular basis, back and forth, OK? So that's when I kick it. It doesn't matter how I start it, whether I kick it like this or whether I throw it down like this, the conversion, the, the, pro the motion is basically the same. But now there's a second thing I can do. So things like to vibrate, convert energy of potential to energy of motion back and forth at a certain time scale. But there's another thing. If I was the wiggle, if I wiggle this end slowly, no vibrations. If I wiggle it very fast, no vibrations. But if I wiggle it at just the frequency it likes to swing at, or not swing at, vibrate at, the energy builds up and up and up and up. And that's enough. <laughs> so there's two different ways of driving one of these things that like to vibrate. And now we're going to do a number. Oh, I'm going to do this one, OK? Yeah. Uh, here is an object. And oh, thank you. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to hold this rod in the center. It's just a plain old aluminum rod. And I'm going to put some rosin on my fingers. And I'm going to tickle it. And that's a little bit like kicking the spring. It's going to vibrate how it likes to vibrate. But it can't vibrate much because of it. I'm holding it here. And it vibrate. OK, you want to put it on now? Yeah. Styrofoam cup. It's also a loud speaker. That's why speakers are shaped in this fashion. It's an efficient way of adding sound energy to the air. So That's it transfers the energy from this vibrating thing into it vibrations of the air. Now, if I hold it here, it has to be no vibrations here and vibrations here. and That's a shorter distance. So it happens to be a higher sound, a higher frequency sound. And we'll talk more about that later. So I tickle it here, and it's a little higher. Okay, that's because my laser. I don't know where you put it. Well, <laughs> too many pockets. <laughs> that's because I was holding it here, and this is how it is vibrating. And so if I transfer my fingers to the other side over here, it's not vibrating there. But when I grab it at the middle, I kill it. This is a little bit like playing a musical instrument. If you're going to put your fingers down at a place on the guitar, it changes the frequency of vibration of the strings. The okay? That's the only musical instrument I can play. Hey, it's the holiday times, isn't it? Yeah, it's holidays, right? So there's a lot of reasons to go out and get a good meal at some restaurant, right? You might be celebrating something. So kids, when you sit down in that really good restaurant, these glasses will be on the table in front of you. But the waiter knows you're too young to have any wine, right? So sooner or later, the waiter's going to come wandering over and take that glass from the table in front of you. Don't let this happen. <laughs> Instead, take your hand, put it at the bottom of the wine glass, just like that. Hold it nice and tight. Take your other fingers, put it right in your dad's water glass like that. <laughs> and then go ahead and just stroke the top of the glass with that wet finger. And you get a nice pretty tone from that glass. But what's the best part of this experiment? You're going to be bugging your parents. They're going to be like, knock it off. You're bothering everybody. You say, hey, I'm doing physics. This is going to happen all night long. And who else is going to hear this sound, right? That's going to be that waiter, right? And the waiter's like, wait, what is that noise, man? It's supposed to be a quiet restaurant. Hey, you can't do that in my restaurant. This is a quiet restaurant. You say, hey, waiter. I got a question for you. If I take the rest 
of my dad's water. And I fill that wine glass. Do we get a lower tone or a higher tone? Lower. You sound just like the waiter. <laughs> what do we do to find out? Experiment. Lower tone. Oh. It's a lower tone because you now have the density of the water mixing with the density of the wine glass, giving you a lower resonant frequency. So let's take another look at that too, because what I have right over here is a beaker inside a box. Can we pull that on up? Thank you so much, Param. So you see a beaker down there. And here's what I can do with that beaker. I can actually make that beaker ring just the same way I made that wine glass ring, but just with some sound. I'm going to put some sound in there. That beaker is now ringing. But you don't see anything happening up there, do you? You shouldn't just believe me when I tell you something. You really shouldn't. Don't just believe what people say. Get some evidence, all right? So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to turn off that light, and I'm now going to go ahead and turn on this light. And now we're going to turn down all those lights we have right here. And now I'm going to go ahead and put that sound back into the beaker. Because when I do that, what do you see happening to the walls of the beaker? It's actually vibrating. And it's actually kind of violent there, isn't it? But what happens if I give it too much sound energy? Would you like to see that? Of course you would. You're all good physicists. So, three, two, one. Sometimes they don't break. Let's try a little bit more. You don't want to annoy you. Could be now. We'll find out. Three, two, one. There it is. <laughs> Breaks just like that. Could you change from that? You're going to do the propagating glass, yeah. OK? Now what I have right here is a really, really long rope slinky, OK? It's a really long rope slinky. That's just a big, long spring more than anything else. I'm going to come over here to the other side of this room like this. And what we have is Mark's got one side of the long rope slinky. I have the other side of the long rope slinky. But that slinky spring has also a lot of tension on it. I'm actually kind of pulling on Mark a little bit. But I can now do this to the rope slinky. I'm going to give it a nice karate chop. Watch what happens. I give it that karate chop, and that wave travels back and forth across the rope slinky. I can move that wave by hitting it like that. So that propagates the wave across that splinky. There's a lot of energy there, and the energy is moving through, as you can just see right there. But we can do this in a whole other way. Let me see if I can show you that, too. Because I, what I have right over here is our most expensive experiment. What's that? A garbage can. Yeah, they cut the budget at Rutgers. This is the most expensive <laughs> thing. And here's what I can do. What's that got on one side? That's a hole. And on the other side, I got a big slab of rubber, just like right there, right there. More than anything else, this is like a big drum. And here's what I can do to this big drum. I can hit on it like this. And some of you here may feel something. And I'm not calling any one of you liars. You're not liars, OK? That's not what this is about. Hey, you there in back, did you feel anything? And if they turned around and they said, hey, Oh, look, I felt something. You have to believe me. Do you necessarily really have to believe what they say? No. You want proof of things in life and in science. We really do. We have to look for some evidence. So Will here has a candle. And a lot of times in science and in physics, we do this a lot. We see action at a distance. We don't really see kind of what's happening here, but we see the effect it has on something else. So Will lights that candle. Will hold it out front. And here's what I can do. Blow the candle out. So you now all know that something's happening there, right? But did you see what was going on? No. And in physics and in science, what we like to do more than anything else is actually see exactly what's going on. So I'm going to put a little theatrical fog inside this garbage can. Now, theatrical fog is just glycerin we heat up. It becomes a fog, and they put glycerin in all your food. They just don't tell you, so don't worry about this. But what I'm going to do now was actually happening every single time I hit this garbage can. You just didn't see it. And this, to me, is one of the reasons why science is so much fun. What is that? It's a ring. It's a ring of air. Yeah, and I can even aim it for that. 
<laughs> You're going to build one now? <laughs> I hope so. Build one. Go home and build one. Now, what's that shape? That's a circle. What's that shape? So I'm going to take the square and I'm going to put it right here on the front of my garbage can. What are we going to see now? Sparkles. How about a heart? How about a rhombus? What are we going to see? Are you curious? Yes. Human beings should be curious. Let's put a little, oh, yeah, let's put a little more fog right here in our garbage can. All right. Place your bets with some money from your neighbors. Because <gasps> the only stable shape is a smoke ring. Smoke squares are like unicorns. You want them to be real, but they really don't exist. Sometimes in life, things really don't exist. And that's true in physics, and it's true in life, isn't it? Yeah. Now, what's really kind of fun about this, anybody here know the term gravitational waves? Yeah. Ever hear of that? When two black holes or two neutron stars combine in our universe somewhere, they actually shake space-time. You saw space-time out here in our, our atrium, right? Well, they shake space-time. And they actually propagate through the universe in a certain way. I can actually show you just what gravitational waves look like with this garbage can. I'm going to put a little more fog in here. But when I do that, I'm going to use this. What's that? An ellipse. Put it right here in the front of the garbage can. Put a little more fog in here. Believe it or not, this is a modern physics demonstration with a garbage can. <laughs> This is exactly what those gravitational waves look like. They propagate through the universe looking just like that. An oscillating ellipse, back and forth just like that, with a quadrupole motion, just like that. So now you all know what a gravitation wave looks like. Go home and tell people, all right? There you go. OK, to the waves now. OK. Now those are propagating disturbances that are just one <laughs> shot and it's different on the other sides. But there's regular waves called simple harmonic waves that are like t nice tones that a person would sing. They travel through the air. Or if you vibrate a rope up and down, these waves travel and they have a certain speed in the forward direction. And I want you to notice here's one that's vibrating slowly. Here's one's vibrating quickly. And the wave, the disturbance they create, has a certain distance between the biggest swings in one direction and the biggest swings in the other direction. We call that the wavelength of the wave. And how rapidly it vibrates is the frequency. So in terms of sound, this vibration would be a very long wavelength, very low frequency. It would be like, I was never in choir, I'm afraid. <laughs> this one right here has a very high frequency, so it would be like ee, 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 I, I get confused at any rate. So those are traveling waves that vibrate plus and minus. And now we're going to we're going to do this one, but once go to the go to the simulation of the uh, two directions added. Turn it on. Here, what we're going to do is we're going to vibrate one end of a rope, and the waves go traveling down. They hit the other end, and they go down as the red wave, and they come back as the blue wave. And you see they add up. And when they add up, look what happens. The sum of the two always has the big vibration at the same position, always has the zeros at the same position. It's a very special wave, depends on the length. Now go to the standing wave. Here is a vibrating rope. <laughs> this is what we call the jump rope wave. And it has a maximum in the middle. And zeros at the end. Now if we go to a little higher frequency, 
You see now we have a nice zero or node in the middle. We have two maximums here and here if I don't hit it with myself. And then we go to a little higher frequency and you see there's a maximum, maximum, and there's two zeros. Can we go? Oh, yeah. Beam them up, Scotty. Yeah, that's it. More power. Uh, now it has one, two, three zeros, okay? So the point is, if you have a certain length, there's only very special waves that like to exist stably on that length. Very much like if you have a, put your finger on a guitar and pluck it, you've established the length over which the vibration occurs. And now we're up to, oh, now Dave's going to show you standing waves that are truly spectacular. So I'm going to ask everybody here a really, really, really strange question, all right? See if you can answer this question. How big is that sound? How big? Why is that a strange question? How do human beings measure sound? We know if a sound is loud, if a sound is soft. We don't know if a sound is large or small, right? We measure elephants with what? Our eyes. We know an elephant is large because of our eyes. Well, let's see if we can see sound. Because here's what I can do. I can show you exactly how large that sound is. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take some propane and put it inside this long tube. Just like that. Maybe hit the lights. And now that I have all that flame on the top Darkening there, the screen, I'm yeah. going to bring it down to a nice even flame. Excellent. OK? And now I'm going to put that sound back inside. Because when I do all of that, we see the sound. See if I can bring that down a little bit more. Let's bring that down a little bit. Soon we'll be singing happy birthday to Mark with this many candles. But <laughs> that's the sound. If you could see that sound move through the air to your ears, that's the sound wave you'd actually see. That's it right there. So you're now seeing the size of that sound while you listen to it. That's how big it is. But hey, that's just one tone we have in this tube, right? What if I change the tone? What if I go higher in tone? Let's see what could happen. Because here's our sound now. But I go higher, it's actually a smaller wave. Just like that. If I go lower in tone, it's actually a bigger wave. So you're now actually seeing the relationship between the sounds you hear all the time and the size of their waveforms. But you know, that's just one tone we have in here. What if we put a song in here instead? What might we see? All the dancing waves in a song. And I bet, I know, you all have your favorite songs. I know that. And guess what? I'm not going to play any one of them. No. <laughs> instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a song I think you all know. And you say to me, Dave, how do you know a song that we all know? You know, that sounds kind of impossible. So many generations, so many kinds of people. But I actually have hardly yet to meet almost anyone. Oh, did our music thing not go? There we go. Come on, you. There we are. Here. These iPads are a little fussy sometimes, right? But here's a song, and I bet you all know it. Let's see what happens in our two. What song is that? Star Wars. Who doesn't know Star Wars, right? And now we're going to see all the waveforms that we have in that Star Wars song. Some are big waves, some are small waves. But we see the waveforms we have in our tube right here. Just like that. Hey, this is how I play my stereo at home. I know. That's how it is. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that one. It's one of my favorite demonstrations of all time. There you go. Don't tell his fire insurance company. <laughs> OK. So now we're up to do some. Got to do some light. Oh, yes. We're ready with a different kind yeah. of wave. You got it? Yeah. Okay. Well, it so happens there's another type of wave, and that wave is called electromagnetic waves. And if it's in the visible range, we call it light. And so a regular old laser is just a vibrating wave. It has an electric field and a magnetic field. 
and they propagate along a certain direction. And the speed of light, Einstein tells us, and we, he was driven by experiments, is the same no matter how you look at it, unless it enters from air into a deep medium in which the electrons in there have to vibrate with it, and it slows down. And when it passes into here, it's slowing down makes the beam bend. And now... You're ready to go. Your laser should be right there, right? Yeah, I got the laser. Okay. And we're going to do the uh, smoke. Yep. Where do I do the pr smoke? Then we're going to take off the screen. Okay, so here's the light beam. Here's, here's the light beam. And you see if it comes in at that angle, look what it does when it goes inside. It changes direction. Can you see how it changes direction? You need a little more here. Yeah, it's not working. Can't do it? Okay. Okay, so it's coming in like this to right here, and then it changes. I'll, I'll point from one corner to the other. When it's on the outside, it goes like that. But when it goes inside, it hits right over here. The light is changing direction. Now, whenever you have a light change direction, when it hits a surface, it also reflects. And so you see that spot over there? That's reflecting off this surface. So whenever it changes, slows down, or speeds up, it reflects off that surface. Now there's another effect, and that's if I have it come in from the inside, can you see now how it reflects off the top surface there? And let me move this a little bit over here. Okay. And so it's totally internally reflected. Now you see there's another light beam here. And that comes from the reflection, reflection from this surface. But this one stays entirely in the medium and stays there. That's called total internal reflection. So light reflects when it hits a surface and it also changes direction. Now this particular block I dumpster dove for the particle physics people were using it for uh, glowing when particles hit it. And so if you shine an ultraviolet light, it tickles it also. And I can also... Show them over there, Mark. Oh, well, I can't turn my head that far. <laughs> can you see the... Is it there? Yeah. Put another color on. <laughs> you should see what my pillows look like at home. Okay. <laughs> Now, there's another thing I want to show you. Yeah, the right here. energy of the light can be very different. Okay. Oh, you want to hold it? Yeah. Okay, well, let me stand where I know where I am going. Uh, if I shine a very intense green laser beam on here, not much happens. But if I show a, shine a higher energy violet laser beam, yeah, in the other direction. <laughs> well, I know this could be better. Uh, you see, you kick the electrons out and they have to go looking around for a place to find, to find home again, and they drop in another place, and that's, that's phosphorescence. Now, ah oh yes, this is a really useful item, especially when you get old. A glow in a dark toilet seat. Mark's got them all through his house. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's the interaction of light with solids or materials. Now Dave is going to show you an interesting effect that has to do with light on? reflecting off surfaces when it changes speed. That's it. All right, so what do we see in our camera image right here? What do we see? Some beakers, right there, right there on the stand, there's two beakers right there. Can you see both beakers? Yeah, you can easily see both beakers. No, not yet, not yet. Okay, move it up for a second. So you can easily see both beakers. So they're right here. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take some magic fluid. Oh, it's not magic fluid, is it? It's actually just vegetable oil. And I'm going to pour it inside that very first beaker. Just like this. Do you see that beaker filling up? 
Well, it actually, actually is very, very important. This is what's going on. You can see those beakers because they're bending light, right? But this fluid that we have right here, please get that out of the way that way. This fluid that we have right here is actually the exact same index of refraction. So when light goes through the fluid or the glass, it bends exactly the same way. So if I let that fluid go around the beaker, what happens? What's happening to that middle beaker? It's disappearing. And we will no longer see the middle beaker when I let the fluid go all around it. When the light no longer bends, there's no reason for you to be able to see it. That's what we have right here in vegetable oil in that glass that we have. I hope you like that one. That's a fun one. Now, please take those glasses out that we gave you. If you don't have those glasses, let us know. We're love it. happy to give you another set of glasses. Hey, when's the last time Rutgers gave you something for free? <laughs> Doesn't happen often. So, here's what we're going to do. We're actually going to go ahead and turn on this light right there. Using those glasses, what do you see when you look at that light bulb right there? Rainbows. rainbows. And rainbows are like unicorns, but real, right? We love rainbows, right? So that's what you get on both sides of those glasses. And like I say, they're our gift to you, all right? In physics, we dissect light. You're now seeing what's coming from that light in the glasses. It has all those colors that you're seeing right there in your rainbow. And what's kind of interesting, too, we can actually tell temperature from the rainbow you see. In physics, we tell temperature from the rainbow of light we're getting. All right? So Mark, take it away. OK, if we start turning up the, te the temperature's high now, right? Yeah, real high. All right, so let's start turning down the temperature. What do you see disappearing first? Purple disappears first, OK? That drops out and now it's mostly just red and green. It eventually just goes to red and then it would go to infrared. So if something looks like it's red, it's low temperature. If something looks like it's blue, it's high temperature. That means we can see things, the temperature of things like stars and other things uh, without ever actually touching them. Uh, a blacksmith would know this. He knows that he has to heat up iron to white hot in order to be able to bend it very easily. If it's just growing, glowing cherry red, it's going to be still very stiff and he doesn't waste his time with it. I'm going to turn that down. You want to show him that? First? Uh, I'll do the slides all at once. Okay. So what we're going to do now is some tickling some gases. Do you see this one right here? It's got some reflections, but it's got a couple very prominent lines there. Can, what color are they? Red. Red. There's a, there's a, there's a, yeah, cyan, I don't even want to call it. But the red one is the most famous line in the entire universe. That's the hydrogen line for hot hydrogen clouds. 80% of the universe is hydrogen. We're ready, want to try yeah. the next one? We're going to try the next one. This is tickling another gas. What's the most prominent color? What's the color of the sun? Yellow. Yellow, remember that. This is helium. The other 20% of the universe is helium, with 1% everything we've ever, we've ever touched being the other uh, less than 1%. Now this one, mm, that's an interesting color. It looks kind of whitish. Let me see, can we turn the light bulb up yeah. on above it? If you look, compare the two, they're displaced from each other, but they have almost the same set of colors. That happens to be mercury, and there's mercury powder on the inside of that light bulb, a compound of mercury, uh, which is why you have to be careful in disposing of those things. And then this one is... This is a lot of fun, this one, right? This is, of course, of course the honky-tonk color. This, 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 is, uh, this is neon, right? So use those glasses all around your house. Use those glasses on all the lights you have. You've got a lot of different lights. Go ahead and find out, dissect all those lights. We're going to show you a little bit One thing. about how much fun you can have with those glasses. You can see you dissect all those lights. Use them on your holiday lights. Use them in New York City at night. 
Use them on a full moon. A full moon is spectacular with those glasses. It really is quite pretty. Just never look at the sun with those glasses or with your bare eyes. That can actually blind you almost immediately, so don't do that. But let's see how much fun we can have with these glasses. I turn it on, and what do you see happening in your glasses now? But watch what happens as these colors start to change. As those colors change, you can now see color mixing in action. Because as they shift through the different colors, let's see if it goes. Come on, you. I know you want to do it. Yeah. OK, yeah. There, right there. You can see, oh, we can see exactly what, oh, oh no, he went off, so that's OK. We'll move on to okay. our next thing. There you go. Now, we want this one back on, or you just want to show your slides? Oh, uh, show a couple. Of, what, which Let's one back on? Slide. You want to show the absorption one? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Is that the one you meant? This is one okay. right here. So I'm going to turn this one on now. What do you see there in that rainbow? What color is missing? Yellow. yellow. There's a black line where that yellow should be. Hey, I don't say it, bold manufacturers say it. They say human beings don't like yellow light mixed up with their full rainbow. So they actually coat the interior of this bulb with a material that absorbs that yellow. It doesn't let it out of the bulb. They're stealing your light. <laughs> yeah. Hey, astronomers do the exact same thing every day. We look at any starlight in our universe. If there's black lines like that in the starlight, we know exactly the material that's in between us and any star in the universe. Think about how powerful that is in terms of physics and knowledge. You're doing it right now. So okay. that's what we have to back to the slide show. Right there. All right, unblank that screen and come back to our computer. There you go. Okay, now here's an illustration of how you use it in astronomy. Here is the constellation Orion, which in January will sort of be over here. And there's three belt stars, the only three stars that line up so nicely in the sky, and they point down to the horizon, and you see the star Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. If you want a physics joke or astronomy joke, you, somebody says, are you serious? You said, no, I'm not serious. Serious is the brightest star in the sky. OK, so isn't that funny? <laughs> it's, a, it's actually a binary star. But now here, so these are hot white stars. And if you look at their spectrum, they've got lots of blue in them. All right? If you look at Betelgeuse up here, while the hand's extended of Orion, he's nice and red. That means that he's cool. These other guys are about 11,000 degrees Kelvin. This guy's only about 3,000 degrees Kelvin. So he has lots of red in his spectrum, and you can see him in the sky. You can point to him and tell your friends and your parents about this, or your grandparents. Uh, below the three belt stars, there are the feet down here, but there's also the sword right here. And in the middle, you can't actually see it uh, with the naked eye, usually. But there is a glowing red cloud. And if you look at that through, these are, by the way, diffraction gratings. They have lots of little lines on them that separate out the colors. And if you look at the Orion Nebula, you see this spectrum right here. Does that spectrum look familiar? Remember the red? What was the red for? Hydrogen. OK, that's a glowing hot cloud of hydrogen where new stars are being born and lighting up the nebula, the cloud around them. Go to the next slide. And here is that yellow helium line, remember? That was first observed in 19, 18, 1850. 1850, there was a solar eclipse, and they looked at the spectrum, and they saw a spectrum they'd never seen before. They knew all the spectra of many elements of the periodic table, but they'd never seen this one before. So it was discovered in the atmosphere of the sun, so they named it after the sun, Helos. Helium, that's the only element of the periodic table that was not discovered on Earth and was discovered in the sun. It's an impurity in oil production, but they hadn't realized that. Now, yeah. we've already done ultraviolet light. We've seen all the rainbows you can see with visible light. But we're actually now going to play on the other side of that spectrum that you really can't see usually. That's called infrared light. And infrared light is actually what we have 
And we think of it as heat. But this is all of you. Yeah, and infrared light, you're always glowing like this because you're always kind of warm. You can actually tell temperature by how much infrared light you're giving out. And you are one hot audience. Yeah. You can actually tell exactly your temperature with this camera. OK? Look at that. And you're all glowing all the time. You don't know that you're glowing because you can't see in infrared, right? You don't know it all the time. But you know what? Infrared, which is right next to red, doesn't work the same as visible light. You actually already know that, but let me explain how you know that. You go to the beach, you park your car, you go off to the water, you come back five or six hours later. How hot is your car? Hot. hot. Really, really warm inside. Why? Visible light gets right through the windows, right? No problem. Heats up the interior of the car. Changes into infrared light. Tries to get back out the windows. Can't get through the glass. Let's see that. Mark right here has a sign. Show him the sign, Mark. Ah, uh, yeah, no, no, but you have to sign. focus. Yeah. Show them. Oh, yeah. But can you see that, Mark that through that show. sign? Visible light goes right through that sign, and you can see Mark. But let me put this camera on Mark, and notice that visible that infrared light doesn't go through the glass. Doesn't go through the plexiglass. Just like your car, it stops the infrared light. Well, we got another object here. Mark, you go ahead and you show them this. Let's see if they can see you through this. They just like right, right there. A black plastic trash bag. Mark's now going to put it over his body. And what we're now going to do is show you we can still see Mark. He's sticking his tongue out at you. Visible light is stopped by the black plastic, but infrared light is not, right? It's right next to red, but it doesn't work the same. A big round of applause for Mark. <laughs> that, that wasn't a used trash bag, no, was it? Wasn't. <laughs> and don't go home and put a bag on your body, okay? Don't do that. Okay. Now we're going to shift gears. We're going to do a whole other part of physics. We're going to talk about why things sink and float. And I got myself right here. I got some water. Anybody here ever take a bath? Yeah, I could probably use one right now. That's water right here. What's this right here? Soda. What kind of soda? Pepsi. Regular Pepsi. You ever pick up a regular Pepsi, a regular Coke? No. I'm not saying you drink this stuff. I'm just saying you pick up the can. <laughs> you ever pick up a can of soda? Yeah. yeah, almost everyone's done that. What's this one right here? Diet, Diet Pepsi. So this is water. This is soda. And you know all the parts of our experiment. So I'm going to take this soda and put it in the water like this. When I do that, does the soda sink or float? Wait a second. I thought you knew all about this stuff. What's it going to do? What do we do to find out? Experiment. we got to do the experiment. So I'm going to put it right in, place your bets, win some money from your neighbors. Because it sinks. Diet soda, sink or float? Flow why? Because it's not, what kind of theory is that? <laughs> they give you the same amount of soda. They give you the same amount of bubbles. Why would this float and not sink? I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. You go home and do it. Or you want me to do it. You're that curious now, and that's exactly what a scientist is. A scientist is just a really a curious human being. So I'm going to go ahead and put it in. What's it going to do? Float. <laughs> Now, science is not just about the experiment. Science is about why. Why? How do they sweeten that soda right there? Sugar. And there's a lot of sugar in that soda. You take the sugar out of that soda, it's a good inch and a half of sugar inside that can of soda. That's what you're drinking. Yum, yum, yum. Okay. What do they sweeten this one with? Rat poison. I mean, aspartame. <laughs> they were looking for rat poison when they came up with aspartame, you realize? What does that make us? The rats, yeah. And you only need a little bit of that extremely powerful chemical to make it as sweet as all that sugar. But who here has ever been in a swimming pool? Me. Who here has ever been in our lovely ocean? Me too. Hey, where do you feel a little of a buoyant force lifting you up? Ocean why? What's in the ocean? Salt. salt, right? Sharks, toilet paper, lots of stuff. So if you go ahead and pour salt into this water bath, it actually takes that soda that was at the bottom and brings it right up to the top. That soda is now floating right at the top. Sinking and floating is all about relative density, as we just showed you right there. Now, what floats in our atmosphere? Balloons. Guys, balloons? the balloons. 
What floats in the atmosphere? You get a birthday, what do they give you? A balloon, right? What's in a balloon that floats? Helium. And have you ever made funny voices? Yeah. yeah, we all really like helium. Helium's a whole lot of fun stuff. And what I have right here in this blue balloon, that's a helium balloon. And here's what we're going to do to that blue balloon. We're going to pop it. No. Yeah, but we're going to tell you when. I know people are more scared of popping balloons than almost anything else in life. <laughs> so Mark's going to pop that balloon right now. But here's what happens when we pop that helium balloon. The helium leaves the balloon, leaves our auditorium, goes all the way up to the top of the atmosphere, and leaves the Earth. Earth's gravity is not strong enough to hold helium to the Earth. So basically, that helium goes off into outer space. And this is all true. So we're actually running short of helium here on the Earth, because any helium in the air goes off to outer space. So we're now going to need to float our balloons with a whole other chemical, which is really, really, really cheap. We're never, ever, ever going to run out of it. But I'm not sure you should use it to float a balloon. Let's show them, Mark. So this is hydrogen. And when we light it up, it does chemistry and burns to water. Three, two, one. <laughs> What kind of balloon are you going to ask for? <laughs> Hydrogen! <laughs> okay. Plug it in right here. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you. What were those balloons floating in? Air. Air. What's inside you? Air. Air. What's inside this drum? Air. And all the air on the inside of the drum is pushing like this. And all the air on the outside of the drum, we saw with our ping pong cannon, gets adding a lot of pressure to the outside of that drum. Pushing hard on that drum. So the only reason it's actually holding its shape is all the air on the inside. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take all the air out of this drum. And in doing so, what's going to happen to the drum? It's going to crush. And we really have no idea how violent that's going to be. Yeah. And we really have no idea exactly when that's going to happen. So we're just going to let it sit there. Don't worry about it, OK? <laughs> Don't even think about just it. Just forget all about it. Now, what I'm going to tell you now is one of the things I want you to take home with you and remember. That's not it. <laughs> Pay no attention to that. Uh, here I have a simulation of two gases. And these are the molecules running around here, the atoms running around here, and the atoms running around here. And what's the difference? That's not it. Pay no attention to that. Uh, what's the difference between these two? This one is, they're moving fast. What are these guys doing? How much energy of motion per average on here? A lot. How much energy of motion over here? A little. This is low temperature, that's high temperature. That's all temperature is. The average energy per particle. In the case of a gas, it's the average energy of motion per particle. <laughs> Uh, and so that's the real meaning of temperature, how fast the gas is going. Now, when these things hit the wall, they bounce off very gently, so they push on the wall in this very low pressure. Over here, they bounce off hard, and so there's a big pressure. So pressure you can think about in the same way. So now you just don't have to use the words temperature and pressure. You know what they mean in terms of little microscopic moving atoms. Now, in this, my, my friend, the tin can here, he has all the gas being removed from the inside, so the gas hitting on the inside isn't pushing out anymore. But there's 14.7 pounds per square inch pushing in on the outside. 
So sooner or later, something's going to have to give, I suspect. It doesn't always happen, but I do believe it will. Is it, is it, do you think it's going to make it? Oh, yeah, it'll make it. Okay, Can all right. Can we move on to this? Why don't you push that out here in front? Sure. Here we are going to use changing temperature for liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen to change temperature, get access to very low temperatures. And uh, this is one of my favorite demonstrations. Think nothing about that. Uh, <laughs> Did that scare anyone? <laughs> we all need new underwear now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll be right back. I have to change. <laughs> So finally, this really, really strong steel drum crushed by the pressure of that atmosphere. You can see how it deformed that heavy, heavy, heavy steel. That's all that force that's pressing on you all the time. And watch this. We can pull that out. We actually get none of the steel to then reform, right? Even though the air goes inside, this is so crushed, right? Just like a beer can I crushed in my head last night. <laughs> it's not coming back, right? So that's what we got with atmospheric pressure. Okay, this is one of my favorite demonstrations because it illustrates that that hot that the molecules or the atoms moving fast and slower are the meaning of temperature. This is a helium balloon, and it's inflated, and so it's pushing out on the plastic, and the molecules are moving, the atoms are moving very quickly in here. But if I put it in liquid nitrogen, by the way, I've been using liquid nitrogen for 50 years or more. Uh, you have to keep your distance from it. And so if I start cooling this guy down, yeah. the molecule, the second. atoms of helium start doing what? Slowing down. Slowing down, that's right. Their temperature drops, average temperature drops. And the push on the balloon becomes less. And therefore the balloon gets smaller. And we keep on doing it. And, but the overall number of the weight of everything stays the same and the volume is getting less so eventually it gets to the point where it's more dense than air and my helium balloon doesn't float anymore. But then it starts warming up again and the atoms start moving faster and they start pushing out on the balloon and the volume of the balloon increases. And it floats again, all right? So that shows you exactly what I was showing you about moving atoms and temperature. Now, I have a number of other things here. Tongs, no tongs, I'll okay. That's all right. You got the gloves there too. Yeah. Oh, these fit, finally. What's that? A carrot? That's what they said yesterday. That's a hot dog. <laughs> this shows you what happens if you just stick your finger in liquid nitrogen. Okay? It's really, really cold. I've got a couple other things here. Let's put them out as gently as I can. What's this here? Broccoli. broccoli. I didn't used to like broccoli so much, but then you put garlic on it, it's delicious. Yeah. And okay. this is a, and this is a banana split. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you have to be careful about physics jokes. Okay. Be careful of a physicist who offers you a banana split. <laughs> okay, here are some nice soft flowers, very, very fragile and very soft. And uh, I'm going to freeze them and they should become as brittle as glass. <laughs> so that should be enough. And they shatter instead of just deforming. Okay, so things change properties a lot when you go to low temperature. Stay clear of liquid nitrogen. Go behind? Ah, uh, yes, okay. Now, the thing about a liquid 
nitri liquid nitrogen. You should do it from behind. Yes, OK. Uh, is that it is a very concentrated, it, it, it's very concentrated nitrogen. And if I put it in a, in a container at room temperature, it boils vigorously. And that means its volume increases by about a thousand times when it goes into the gaseous state. So if I put a cork in it, what do I have? A gun. <laughs> we have our liquid nitrogen cannon. Kelly, launch. Come on, come on, warm up. <laughs> Give me some more of that. That's awfully unsatisfying. <laughs> Not quite sure why that happened, but <laughs> okay. Now, this demonstration always reminds me of my father. He worked in a nitroglycerin factory. And when they hired him, they brought him into his laboratory, and they gave him all this nice equipment. But he noticed that it had uh, three very strong brick walls and one very weak wooden wall. And he said, what that? Well, he said, well, that's a blowout wall. Because if you make a mistake and there's an explosion, then we just sweep up all the glass, we build a new wall, and we hire another guy. <laughs> and we keep on going. And, uh, but in point of fact, if you're ever going to work with explosives, you want to better to be something like a blowout wall there. Because some of the energy, the explosion, and the pressure surge goes out through that wall and helps you too. OK. All so, right, remember we saw those light bulbs before, right? Yeah. So I'm going to show you a whole new version of a light bulb. What I got right here is what? Pickle. It's a pickle. And I'm going to take this pickle, I'm going to put it across two leads, just like this. Now I'm going to put the exact same amount of voltage that we had inside all those light bulbs. I'm going to turn on a switch. When I do that, I'm now putting energy, the same energy we had in all those light bulbs, going through this pickle. But what happens when I actually do that? What do you see happening to our pickle? That is now a pickle light bulb. There's no real difference. Is it giving you light? Yeah. yeah. Just like all those other light bulbs. We're putting electrical energy in. It comes back out as light energy. And I know it stinks, and I know it's going to burn out soon, but then you still have a great snack food. So what's wrong with that, right? <laughs> And I don't really know if I recommend plugging vegetables into the wall. That may be a bad idea. <laughs> but it shows you now exactly what any light bulb is. So there you go. Pick a light bulb. Lights on? Thank you. OK, now we're going to do something quite different. Oh, got one. They're about the same. They're about the same. Uh, here we have an electron gun. It's an old cathode ray oscilloscope in which you shoot electrons at high velocity towards the front screen. We have it protected. You should never open up anything like an old TV or a cathode ray oscilloscope because there's high voltages in there that can stick around. And here I have a magnetic field. It's a magnet, and the magnetic field really lines come out at the ends, and they bend around that. like that. Now, the charged particles, if you, try, if you shoot them right down the magnetic field lines, they don't feel any force. If you try and shoot them across the magnetic field lines, they get bent to the side. So watch what happens if I bring the magnet in straight in, and you can see that the spot stays essentially the same spot. It stays there the whole time. But if I go back here, here's the path of the uh, moving electrons, and I bring the magnetic field in perpendicular to the path, you see that it pushes the spot off to the side. It deflects the electrons off to the side. If I reverse the direction of the electric field, the magnetic field, it pushes the electrons off to the other side. 
So you can steer electrons right and left with magnetic field lines. That's what they way you used, that's what you, they used to do in old cathode ray oscilloscopes. They have other ways too. Now, this is the Faraday lecture. We call it the Faraday lecture because Michael Faraday did a children's lecture all the way back in 1820. Uh, he started a tradition. And when we started our tradition, we didn't, you know, we didn't want to call the Dave and Mark show. We wanted, <laughs> wanted to get some gravitas to it. So we named it after his, uh, his Christmas lecture series for children. And the Faraday effect has to do with a changing magnetic field making electrical current move. And here I have a coil, and if I would just, this is a galvanometer that deflects to the side if electrons move, I'll move this over here, if electrons go around the circuit in one direction or the other. And here I have a magnet, if I would have this magnet and I would just put him at rest in here, nothing happens. But if I move the magnet, there's a change. If I push the magnet in this way, I get a big change. If I pull it out, it goes the other direction. If I put it in here and I flip it around, the electricity goes back and forth. Current flows in one direction and the other. Well, so I could put this in a power dam, put a paddle on it, flip it around lots of time, and I could generate electricity in this way. And that's the way you can use hydroelectric power, or you can u also use it with a jet engine. So I, should I start with this no, one? Go right this here. one. This start one? with this, because we're going to move that camera. Oh, OK, good. <clears throat> I'll get in the back. Oh, I have to catch it from the front, though. OK, this is a magnet. And this is a piece of copper. And if I roll the magnet down the copper, do you think I can get around to the front and catch it? Beautiful. Just focus? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> yes. Because as it rolls down, it's making electricity flow in the copper, and the energy goes from the rolling or moving of this guy into electrical energy in the copper. The neat thing is not just that I can get around and catch it, and it's slowed down, but the fact is that I don't have to be very talented to rake it go down the middle, because if it goes to a side, it's like a canoe, and it doesn't like to go off the side because the changing magnetic field over here doesn't grab a hold of any electrons. The one over here does, and so it's like a canoe. You paddle on this side and it steers you back into it. Oh, yeah. This is the next one? Yeah. So as Mark had right over there, it was a very powerful magnet, right? And he had a big slab of copper right there. Well, here I have copper tube. This is a copper tube. And basically this was an old big wire. Think about how much current they used to pass through this copper that they needed copper of this size, right? And they put coolant through the middle. But you can see down into that copper tube with our camera, which is positioned right there. And remember, this magnet here, just like the magnet over there, isn't actually attached to the copper. A big piece of iron, like the screw in there, you actually have to pull pretty hard. But it doesn't actually attach to the copper. But there is an interface, just like you saw there. Let me take this big magnet and put it down the copper tube. You watch it. It's like an astronaut floating, isn't it? Yeah. As it comes down, it goes down really slow. And you see it comes right down through that. It takes a long time and then drops down. You want to see it again? Of course you do. All good scientists like to replicate the experiment. Remember, copper isn't magnetic. But it does interface with the magnetic field, changing magnetic field, and gives you that same opposing of motion, as you can see right there. So there you go. Now Mark right here, thank you. Right here, Mark also has a magnet that's now not going to move. Remember, we moved the magnet in this one. But now we're going to take aluminum and pass it through the magnet. Watch. Changing magnetic field, electrical current flows in the, in the uh, Aluminum slows it down. The energy of motion goes into electrical energy. Now I have another piece right here that has had the center all cut out. 
Will it slow down too? Yes? No? Okay, let's try it. There's still a path, remember, around the edge for electrical current to flow. And so it still sees the slowing down effect. It's like hitting butter. Now this one, this is something that's barely cut up at all, but that has been cut up from one side and the other side so that no electrical current can flow in large circles, okay? And so the effect should disappear with this one. And he goes through if it's not there. Now there's one additional thing. If I cool something down to liquid nitrogen temperature, the electricity flows much more easily. And you see the effect on steroids. Bam. <laughs> it slows down so much it gets frozen. By the way, don't touch any of these things that have been cooled down to liquid nitrogen temperature because for the same reason you don't put your nose on a mailbox in northern Minnesota in the middle of the winter. Because <laughs> when you pull back, your nose stays on the mailbox. <laughs> okay, here we have electrical current in a coil. That creates an electromagnet. If I turn it on, here is a piece of steel. I turn it off, the iron falls away, all right? And so, but of course it doesn't affect a piece of uh, copper of, alum of aluminum, but if I put it on here, the changing magnetic field makes electrical current flow in a circle, which changes this into a magnet too. And uh, if the two magnets didn't repel each other, I wouldn't be showing you this experiment. It's called the ring flinger. Okay? I used to invite children up and I'd say, okay. oh, who put it on like this, and then I'd turn it on, and the poor child would come up here and go. <laughs> and then I'd turn it off, take it from the child, say, no, no, you just put it on like this. <laughs> they suggested I stop that. <laughs> okay, now if I take a notch out of that circle, electricity can't flow in a circle and it doesn't jump. Of course, the children don't trust me at all by this time. And so I have to show them that the contiguous one jumps and the other one does not, all right? Uh, the next one is if you have a little, if you cool it, Jesus, Dave. <laughs> if you cool it down, the effect is much, much larger. Uh, you noticed I was extremely rapid in that motion, otherwise my <laughs> fingerprints wouldn't be there anymore. Okay, so that's, a f oh yes, and then there's the last step in this, and that is uh, you use a something like this, you put a light bulb across, across the gap. So electricity can flow in a circle and like a light bulb, light a light bulb. And so you have a transformer basically, and you, you turn it on, and without any connection of wires, you can light a light bulb. We'll have to keep our fingers off those wires. The insulation is going. <laughs> okay. Now we have our last group of demonstrations. And for this, I need uh, two volunteers. Two volunteers. Two volunteers. No one, no one ever wants to volunteer in my show. <laughs> Look at uh, me. I volunteered uh, once. <laughs> and you. Mikey, you want to? Come on down. Come on down. There's room he for Mikey too. They were, they were he just, he, they just, he just said. Uh, I, I, I okay, good enough. enough. Okay, yeah, okay. Enough. We'll get a picture What's afterwards. What's your name, young man? Dennis. Dennis, my name is David. So thank you. So thank you so much for joining us. What's your name? Emma, thank you so much. My name's David. It's very good to meet you. Come on back over here. Do you two know what you actually volunteered for? <laughs> you do have health got? insurance, Turn right? <laughs> what do you got right here? The bed of nails. <laughs> Did you change your mind? <laughs> We're kidding. You never volunteer in a physics show. It's a really bad idea, but don't you worry. Don't you You're worry. Not getting anywhere You're not going to get it That's actually my job, Dennis. You come on right back over here, right over there. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this bed of nails, and Mark is actually going to take his body and put it across this great big bed of nails. Then we're going to take a second bed of nails. We're going to put it nails down on Mark. And then my two new friends here get to stand on him. Yeah. What do y'all think of that? 
Good idea. Right idea. Right 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 you got that in your house here? Oh. Now, Emma, you kind of just step right up over here. <laughs> okay, right there. Just lay it right down on Mark. Okay, now she's going to step on the red spot. And Dennis, you come on right over here. No here jumping. Step. No dancing. Right no dancing. Right on. Uh. Just like that. <laughs> now we have two human beings on Mars while he lies between two beds and ales. Don't look like they enjoy it so much. Absolutely, <laughs> wonderfully <laughs> fine. Oh, yeah. How are we doing, Mark? Great, great. We're going to take our volunteers <laughs> off. A big round of applause for our two volunteers. <laughs> Now we do these things not because it's magic, you can go on back here, she's thank you so much. We do it not because it's magic, but because it's physics. You stay right there, Mark, okay, we're not done yet. So let's think about this, because what I have right over here is something really, really similar to Mark. Thin skin filled with hot air. What? <laughs> <laughs> and what I got right over here is a whole lot of nails. Think of it this way. Mark weighs about 200 pounds. Let's say he laid down on a bed of nails with one nail. How many pounds of force on that one nail? 200 pounds, more than enough to drive that nail right through his body and kill him. Let's say our bed of nails had 10 nails. 20 pounds of force on each nail, more than enough to go right through his body and kill him. Let's say our bed of nails had 100 nails. How many pounds of force on each nail? Two. And that actually hurts a lot. I know this personally. At the same time, it doesn't go through your skin. You actually need about 12 pounds of force on a nail to go through human skin. Hey, I'm a scientist. I did the experiment. It was a bad day. <laughs> but I did the experiment. So. We lost the professor. That's it. Well, all these nails now go through that balloon. What do we do to find out? Try it. And there's not enough force in any one nail to go through the skin of a balloon. Here we have half as many nails doubling the force. If I now take that bed of nails and put it on here, will it break this time? Can you really put maybe on exams? I want to know your teacher. Will it break? No. I'm pushing. Half as many again, doubling the force one more time. Will it break this time? This is also our last one. Will it break this time? Isn't that how we do multiple choice tests? Right? It's not A, it's not B, D's a joke answer. Yeah, right through. Nailed it. Now, here's what we're going to do. Can I bring my sign on over? If you like what you see here, come and see us in Manhattan. We've been running for 500 shows in Manhattan doing the same thing, that physics show. But it looks just like a guillotine, right? We're going to put it right here on Mark's neck like this. Yeah, you stay right there. Now, we also have a cinder block. I'm going to put it, yeah, you stay, no, no, no. I'm going to take that cinder block, we're going to put it right here on Mark's rock hard ass. All right? He's been working out a lot. And now we have a sledgehammer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Mark back about 1980 was one of my professors, and he gave me a lousy grade. We can talk about it. It's time. payback time, buddy. <laughs> Here's our experiment. <laughs> Better nails, Mark, brick, sledgehammer. Does Mark live? Yeah. What do we do to find out? <laughs> <laughs> Let's try it. Three, two, one. <laughs> and Mark is actually perfectly fine. Oh, yeah, I'm good. A round of applause for Mark. Where's the... Uh... He gets up slower every year. Oh, oh yeah, there's right there. Oh, yeah. oh. So oh. Mark's got one more demonstration to show you. I'm sorry I went over just a little bit, but he's got one more thing to show you. And for this, Joseph, please go ahead and turn yeah, your camera Yeah, thanks, uh, folks at home.